spent really a lifetime documenting the city. He's famous for his now and then column. So why is Paul Dorpat giving away his collection? I hope to inspire people to come and work with me and others. Much more than a place to live, La Quinta apartment residents want it preserved forever. The building is designed to build community and it just does that. It was a stressful time. Meet the courageous women who proved they could do this dangerous job as well as men. These stories and more next on City Stream. Hi, I'm Tata Vicar Prekyan. Welcome to City Stream from Mohai, the Museum of History and Industry. As pandemic restrictions ease, we have good news. Mohai reopens to the public on April 2nd. Meanwhile, as the country observes Women's History Month, the museum continues to highlight important achievements, including the 95th anniversary of Bertha Knight Landis's big election win. She served as the first woman mayor of a major American city. This museum is filled with treasured photos, and some are captured by ordinary people. These days, a lot of us share old pictures on social media all the time. But before the internet, Paul Dorpat made it his life's work to share photos and his love of the city in his weekly Now and Then newspaper column. The famous photo historian has now donated his amazing collection to the Seattle Public Library. Felix Bunnell explains. I can guarantee you that any city in the country would be thrilled to have someone like Paul Dorpat. We spent really a lifetime documenting the city and collecting material that really reveals sort of the fabric of our city's life. No, I don't think there's other cities that have a Paul Dorpat. Ann Ferguson has known historian Paul Dorpat for a long time. She's curator of the Seattle Collection, thousands of books, photos, maps, and documents that tell Seattle's many stories and which are preserved and made accessible to researchers, like Paul, in the Seattle Room at the Central Library. Dorpat recently donated his collection of Seattle history materials, photos and books and notes from his years of Seattle Times columns to the library. I got to go down to his office on the lower level of his house and I could not stop looking around because every square inch of that space was full of Seattle history essentially. And now all that history is at the Central Library where a lot of work lies ahead to process it and where Andrew Harbison is the assistant director of collections and access. Paul Dorpat is an incredibly important figure in Seattle history. He was uh, a writer for the Seattle Times, published over 1,500 articles of the Seattle Now and Then column, co-founder of the History Link website, which documents a lot of important history in Seattle and the region, and a voluminous collector as well, as you can see uh, among all of these boxes here. These are some of the Helix publications, the underground newspaper that Paul published and was the founder of. And here is just a small sampling of the notes that Paul took to write his over 1,500 Seattle Now and Then columns. The stuff inside those boxes will eventually make its way to the Seattle Room, one of the most remarkable spaces inside one of the city's most remarkable buildings. Ultimately, some of the material will be here in the Seattle Room for the public to access. And what's already in the Seattle Room? Many different examples of uh, historic documents and photographs here. All things Seattle history have a home on the shelves. You could almost imagine Paul Dorpat himself living here. More important local books covering Seattle and the region, and then also some really amazing maps that we have. But where is that tremendous cultural figure and voluminous collector these days? Paul Dorpat, who's in his 80s, recently moved to a senior living facility in his beloved downtown Seattle. Because of the pandemic, we have to interview him from the landing across from his window. I felt that the Seattle room, get that, the Seattle room, at the Seattle Public Library it was a wonderful place to abscond with it. And maybe it's a dumb question, but why is Seattle history so important to Paul Dorpat? Well, I live in the place. I've always been interested in history, and it gives you a depth of the experience of the thing you're studying to study it, you know, and that's, 
That's what truth is, is a hard study on stuff. So I want to know the truth. And what about Ann Ferguson's belief that very few cities have someone like Paul? I think that she's right, that there aren't many people nationwide who have given themselves obsessively to 40 years of study of their local history, especially from the illustrative side of it all. My experience of this presence of the city is really deepened by my knowledge of its past. He's got this perfect combination of, as I said, you know, doing real scholarly research, but being able to pull back and get this higher level view that pulls out for sort of the general public what's really engaging, interesting, intriguing will pull people in and get them to appreciate the history of their city. It seems that while Paul Dorpat's collection of photographs and books and ephemera may be priceless, it's Paul Dorpat himself who's the real Seattle treasure. And he could use your help, once the pandemic is over, getting the collection organized. And I hope to inspire people to come and volunteer and work with me and others and and putting it together, exploring it. There's a lot of exploring to do. And who better to explore it with than Paul Dorpat? Once the pandemic is over, the library will recruit volunteers to help organize Paul Dorpat's incredible archive. And much of his work will make its way to the Seattle Room at the Central Library. Next on City Stream, the push to achieve landmark status for a beloved building that's home to many. Not far from here, along a quiet stretch of 17th Avenue East, sits a tan-colored building that's beloved on Capitol Hill. From the street, the La Quinta apartments blend into the neighborhood, but when you step into its lush courtyard or talk to its residents, it doesn't take long to see its charm. It was built by one of the city's renowned architects, and its thoughtful design brings people together. Recently, La Quinta residents did just that. They organized an effort to seek landmark status. Producer David Albright has the story. I, I moved in for the architecture, because I thought it was an amazing place to live with lots of nice outdoor space. Um, what I didn't expect was the community. It's so easy to just come out into the courtyard in the summer and sit out here and have an impromptu barbecue, kind of share food. You find details everywhere, the, the door handles, the crystal door handles, the wood floors, the arches. People would say this all the time, it felt like a secret garden, like a total little oasis in like vibrant Capitol Hill. It's a challenging space too, right? Because it's a challenge to have a front door that's entirely glass, but then it also creates a little frame. You see people coming and going, you see the life being lived. It's that kind of thing where the proof is in the pudding. Um, the building is designed to build community and it just does that. The La Quinta Apartments, and it was built in 1927, and it was built by a developer, Frederick Anhalt, who some may know. He was very much known for his 1920s uh, apartment buildings. Uh, the La Quinta is more unique because the uh, style is what we call Spanish eclectic. It started because we learned that the building was going up for sale. And because they own the two houses next to this building, we had nightmares of a giant apartment complex or something like that. So none of us really knew how to do it. <laughs> so um, Samantha had started on some links and uh, connecting with people. They put us in contact with Eugenia and, and so we could have a way to, to know how to do this. Once we saw the property and how special it was, uh, Historic Seattle, decided that it was something that um, was very much worth our efforts to help. We were able to find the funding within our budget to have a nomination prepared. And it's kind of neat to see how people have kind of 
come out of the woodwork to, to um, help save it. Yeah, I grew up on 17th and Benny. Um, this is my dad's building. I learned to bike down this street here. I, I remember crashing into a bush down, the, down that way. It was a very sort of integrated environment. The fact that my dad owned it, uh, there was a couple uh, mixed couples. It feels similar. It still has like a Capitol Hill feel to it. I mean, um, I think uh, the gentrification has kicked in. There definitely used to be, uh, I think, more black folks around here. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up in nine, and that was my bedroom. I, I left this building, you know, when I was seven, had no connection to it, but just from living in Capitol Hill, making friends and came to find people that have lived here again. And I think it's that kind of place where people kind of knit together pretty quickly, so. I just want to kind of go over some of the process and the next steps and then what to expect. So February 3rd is the hearing with the Seattle Landmarks Board. Are you planning on all doing verbal comments or some of you might do written or both or? It's not always um, clear cut, you know, so I'm, I'm a little nervous. And definitely work in what, what a benefit it is during this pandemic too, right? To have this Man, space. So much to say. The residents were great because they they were excited. They wanted to participate and help somehow. And so they all had different skill sets on their own. And one of the residents quickly created a really nice website, which is awesome. Another resident is a graphic designer. So she created the Viva La Quinta logo and the poster. And, and so it all kind of came together really well. Several times we've talked about trying to make this happen as a community, but not really knowing how to go about it. So I think this time, it seems like um, with all the support we're getting, that it's possible. As an architect, it's really nice to hear when it feels like architecture actually has an effect on community. And I think in this place, um, it obviously does with the community support. I, I move that the board approve the nomination. I second the motion. Approve. Approve. I approve. I approve. I approve. I approve. And I also approve. We did it. I've been here 17 years, and it's not just a certain group of people, it's whoever lives here. So that's pretty amazing that it keeps kind of fostering the same sort of um, community and interaction. The space creates community. So I mean, I don't know a single person in the city that has that in the way that La Quinta has that. Moving here showed me how important architecture is. Now I really appreciate how buildings actually um, move people through space, how they bring people together or keep people apart, um, how negligent design can just, through no fault of its own, you know, squash community, and something really intentionally designed like this can build it. Achieving landmark status is not the end of the story. The building owners can still sell the property. So part of Historic Seattle's effort is to find a preservation-friendly buyer to make much-needed repairs. But with its new landmark status, many hope it'll foster the same sense of community for years to come. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to CityStream from the Museum of History and Industry. We're joined here by Executive Director Leonard Garfield. Thanks for being here. Uh, well, welcome back to the museum. We are excited for it to reopen. Tell us a little bit about that. It will reopen to the public on April 2nd. April 2nd, Mohai opens the doors, and it's really a chance to welcome Seattle home because this museum is our museum as a community. It tells the Seattle story. But when you come this time, bring your mask and make reservations online at mohai.org and be sure to keep our social distancing rules in, in mind. But we'll do all the cleaning and make it safe and welcome, and we're just so excited to have everyone return. And just in time for spring, as people are strolling around South Lake Union, they can pop by here. What are some of the things they'll be able to see when it reopens? Well, you know, we tell the story of Seattle history. So our major exhibit is called True Northwest. It's everything from the days of native community all the way up to the present. We've got a special exhibit on the history of democracy in our region. And we've got all kinds of exciting uh, programs and activities happening as well. A lot to look forward to when the museum right. reopens. So two years ago, we were here and we were talking to you about the World War I exhibit you had. And the 1918 flu outbreak was prominently featured in that exhibit. Who would have thought 100 years later, we'd be in the middle of another pandemic? You know, it would have been unimaginable two years ago to say that we'd be in lockdown for a year, but it did happen in 1918, and we know it's going to happen in the future. The story of how Seattle responded to the pandemic 100 years ago was really instructive. We took action, and we helped cut the, the death rate. We've done it again, and I think our community's in good shape. We're ready to welcome people back. Another part of that Seattle story that'll be integrated. That's right. We'll be talking about the flu from 1918, and we'll be talking about the pandemic of the recent year as well. So over the next couple months, you have some pretty cool exhibits coming here to Mohai. In the summertime, you'll have one featuring Leonardo da Vinci. Tell us a little bit about that one. Oh, I'm so excited about this one. On July 31st, the inventions of Leonardo da Vinci come to Seattle and they come here to Mohai. You know, if you think of the great figures of history, the original Renaissance man, it was Leonardo. He was an inventor as well as an artist, and 60 of his inventions will be on display. 60 pieces, a lot for people to look forward to from now until then. and after summer as well. Leonard Garfield, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for coming and I'll see everybody on April 2nd. We will circle that date on our calendars. Thank you. Next on CityStream, as we observe Women's History Month, meet the brave women who broke barriers, proving they could do the same job as men. As we observe Women's History Month, this next story profiles a courageous group of women who broke barriers at Seattle City Light. Working on high voltage power lines is a dangerous job that was reserved exclusively for men. That ended 47 years ago when a female crew of electrical trainees persevered despite resentment and harassment. Linda Byron shares this story of will and determination. <laughs> all the jobs in the world, it's one of the most dangerous. I've seen asphalt melt, I've seen wire jump. It could go wrong really, really fast. <laughs> Through that tiny, itty bitty wire, over 14,000 volts. Working with electricity is risky enough, but doing it high in the air? Just make sure you tell your loved ones, I love you every day. Because it is a hazardous job. It is. On a bolt. It's a job dominated by men. Keep that leg locked. Erica Belsby is the sole woman in this group of 10 recently hired for a four-year training to become journey-level line workers at Seattle City Light. For me, I'm fine being uh, around, uh, around the men. Um, um, I'm just, I'm just uh, another one of the uh, guys. Her opportunity is possible because of a few women who broke barriers at City Light 45 years ago. Author Ellie Ballou documents their struggle in high-voltage women. 
It was right after the Boeing bust in the early 70s. In order to get federal dollars for major infrastructure, the city had to meet the minimum affirmative action requirements of the feds, and the feds were finally starting to enforce them. And so that meant this was going to be a poster child program for demonstrating that the city was stepping up. City Light hired a racially diverse group of 10 women to train for electrical careers at the utility. You have that moxie. <laughs> Among them, automotive worker Angel Aerosmith and laundry worker Megan Cornish, an English lit grad from Cornell. <laughs> it's a new day, announced Superintendent Gordon Vickery. Practicing no discrimination regarding sex, religion, race, or any other factor. We were entering into a career at City Light and we could go all the way to the top. But behind the scenes, Vickery appeared to resent the women, even wanting them to fail, cutting training after a week and sending them into the field unprepared. They were isolated, one woman per crew, but they shared a common experience, unrelenting harassment. There was a very strong mystique that this was a macho trade and, you know, a lot of people felt threatened by women trying to do it. The women persevered until three months into the program when they were suddenly fired. They sued. It took a year, but they won their jobs back with a pay raise. We knew it was not going to be easy, but um, it was an adventure starting. Looking back, this photo symbolized a naive belief that trouble was behind them. No, actually, it was really kind of worse until we let them know that, yeah, we did win this job back because we're women. And no, you can't touch us. And we can't be fired. Too often, the women faced male hostility, obscenities and pornography, stony silence, having tools dropped on them, nearly being thrown from a moving truck. Looking at my body language, I'm kind of slumped and hunched shoulders. I just, it, it was a stressful, it was a stressful time. The darkest moment came when a 21-year-old trainee, pressured by the men to work faster, fell and broke her back. Two years later, Heidi Durham was back on the job. They wanted to give her a secretary's job after all that. And she said, oh no, I'm going to be in the electrical trade. <laughs> they found allies. And in particular, the black men tended to be the ones who gave a lot of support to people, gave training, gave undercover support. <laughs> of the 10 trainees, eight would go on to have long careers at City Light. And we were proud to be able to have been given the chance to prove ourselves, and we did. We did it real good. Coming on to the high side. They stand as heroes to the high voltage women of today. I'm just so proud of them that they made it and, it, and that they kept going through the tough times because it opened up doors for people like myself. Sherry Ryder and Shannon Fitch describe a vastly different relationship with their male counterparts. It's like having a whole bunch of brothers that look out for you. Still, the number of women working in the electrical trades at City Light is very small. And as recently as last year, sexual harassment complaints made headlines. In response, the mayor hired a woman to lead the utility. I want to welcome our next CEO of City Light, Deborah Smith. She wants a, a place where we can actually do good work for the people of Seattle and without being distracted by internal stuff. And that means fixing the workplace culture and increasing equity. It's the right thing to do. It's the right time to do it. It's right for women. And I think it improves the quality of work life for everybody. I hope that she really stands up for the women, not just because she is a woman. If she does right, by her job title, she will bring a lot of changes. If the message was that, that biased behavior is not going to be allowed, it wouldn't be there. <laughs> Simple as that.
These policies are made from the top. It's important for the Erica Belsby's of City Light. Being the only woman on a crew is lonely. And when doing one of the world's most dangerous jobs, teamwork can determine whether you go home at the end of the day. Several years ago, Mayor Durkin created the Office of Employee Ombud. This office gives city employees a confidential way to report workplace concerns like harassment and discrimination. We'll be right back. Well, that wraps up this week's episode of City Stream from the Museum of History and Industry. Remember, this museum reopens to the public on April 2nd. And if you'd like to learn more, just go to mohai.org. I'm Tadavika Prakyan. Thank you for watching.